This is the West African country of Niger. Straddling the southern sands of the Sahara Desert, this is a place that may hold the key to solving the world's most pressing environmental challenges, while also possessing nearly limitless potential for investors. What you are about to see is my investigation of this mysterious land and the incredible investment opportunity it may represent. From regional representatives to a sitting cabinet minister, I was given exclusive access to government decision makers. I also sat across from some of the most seasoned resource executives in the world. What they told me, and what I saw for myself, has convinced me that for savvy investors, what lies beneath Niger's shifting sands could translate into a profound, life-changing opportunity. To fully understand what's at stake in Niger, I needed to meet with a member of one of the world's most famous and influential mining families. Govind. Good morning. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you too. Govind Friedland is a geological engineer. So I've heard so much about what you're doing here. His father, billionaire Robert Friedland, has been responsible for some of the world's largest and most lucrative mining projects of the last 30 years. Growing up in the family business, Govind would ultimately find himself in China. I moved to Beijing in 2000, and I'm a runner, and I lived on the 33rd floor in Chaoyang Park, and so it's like Central Park, and I, I, five days a week I couldn't see the, I, mean, I couldn't even see the ground. And this was the reason why. We've seen the headlines, we've heard the numbers. China has an air pollution problem. In the first half of this year, two out of three days in Beijing did not meet World Health Organization standards for air quality. Probably the biggest problem in the world is combating Chinese air pollution. It's a real test to, their, to the government's political imperative, and, and everyone breathes the same air. This was, and continues to be, the same crisis that India, Brazil, South Africa, almost all of the developing world is facing. These places are practically choking to death due to emissions caused by industrialization, while the planet's climate is changing in ways no one could have imagined even a few short years ago. Experiencing this pollution for himself daily, and seeing its social impact, convinced Govind governments are serious about cleaning up their act. It's the most important thing they have to do, because if kids keep growing up with asthma, they're going to civil unrest, they'll, they'll overthrow the, the government. They just it, it can't continue. My father's always saying, be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And the best ways for combating global air pollution is, is nuclear power. Govin decided to become part of the solution by launching Goviex Uranium. Uranium is the fuel used to power nuclear reactors. And today, there are literally dozens of reactors being built from China and India to Europe and the Middle East. China and India have both realized they have got to generate a lot of power to replace their coal. Daniel Major is the man Govind has tapped to lead Goviex. He sees nuclear ultimately coming out on top in the battle with renewable energy sources. People talk about cheap renewable, but actually if you start adding all the subsidies on, cheap renewables are actually not that cheap. The governments are looking at this whole package and realizing that nuclear is actually the cleanest of all of them anyway, and you still have to maintain a base load. Nuclear provides that very clean, low-cost power generation. Today, uranium is priced at its lowest point in over a decade, a scenario primed with opportunity as things look set to change. Demand for uranium is expected to jump dramatically as several large uranium mines are scheduled to run out of ore within the next few years. This, combined with an increase in global electricity usage due to new market trends such as electric cars, means uranium prices have likely already bottomed out. I can see a scenario where there is a sudden tightening up on the supply side and a deficit building going forward in the market. So I think there's a real whipsaw coming in. Uh, the problem is who fills the gap and how, because that's around 20, 23 years from now. So based on history, on previous price spikes that we've seen, potentially what could the uranium price end up doing? Well, if you look at 2007, it went to $140 a pound. Uh, if you look at 2011, which was $90 a pound. So 
from the current spot price at under 19, it can do a lot. So what's clear is that nuclear power will be assuming a greater role than ever before. The big question is, where will the uranium come from when the predicted supply crunch hits in 2020? A former French colony, Niger is the fourth largest producer of uranium on the planet. France had to build its nuclear business up. It was looking for a source of energy, and as a result, one of its major sources has been Niger for a very, very long time. They started their first mine in 1971. About 34% of the nuclear requirements of the French industry comes out of Niger. It's long been claimed that one out of every three light bulbs in France is powered by Nigerian uranium. This is Arlet, the center of Niger's uranium industry and home to the country's two uranium mines. Both of them are owned by Arriva, the world's second largest uranium company, majority owned by the French government. For decades, Arriva had complete control over the entire Nigerian uranium business. But everything changed in the 2000s when the country opened its doors to international investment. Goviex jumped at the opportunity secured the Matawela project next to Arlet, and started drilling. When we were drilling, we kept finding more and more and more and more uranium. And finally, um, we got to about 100 million pounds, which is what Cameco said, this is what separates the men from the boys. And we stopped the drilling. And so now, yeah, we've gone, we have over 100 million pounds uh, measured and indicated. Amanu Balkari is Goviex's Niger country manager. These are the cores that we drilled back in 2013 for the geotech uh, program. This core shack at Matawela displays the evidence of what was, at the time, the world's largest drill program. To call what Goviex has found here world class would be an understatement. The company has one of the largest resources of any exploration or development stage uranium miner in the world but they're not satisfied yet. The more that we explore, the more we find. And there's no end in sight as to what could be found. There's some interesting structures out there that haven't been tested yet. Jerome Randabel is the company's chief geologist. He's running what's called a radon survey. The radon gas will come up through the rocks and to the surface, and by using these little cups on the surface, we'll then be able to measure that there is uranium or not underground. With only a fraction of the project explored, Jerome believes there's probably a lot more uranium to be discovered. For me, it's, yeah, it's, it's blue sky there. It's, it's a lot of blue sky. We have over 100 million pounds measured and indicated, and we've got a 20-year mine life, and, but that will easily go to 40 years. Arriva's been mining 50 years, and it just started with one drill hole. It is a world-class deposit. Um, we have the size, we have the location. For a sandstone-hosted deposit, it's, it's as good as it gets. But maybe the most impressive feature of Goviex, other than the size and scale of its resource, is who's behind the company. You have a blue ribbon group of shareholders. Yeah. Give me some background on who they are. First one, Govan Friedland. He was the first guy in. He's the founder of the company. He saw this opportunity and took it. Cameco came in second. Tim Getzel, current CEO, used to run the Reaver operations. He saw the opportunity of what was around in Niger. Toshiba Corporation joined the company in 2012. They own Westinghouse the largest reactor builder out there. They saw an opportunity in accessing uranium. And then lastly, Denison Mines joined the company. They saw the opportunity of consolidating all their other African assets with ours and to drive forward an African portfolio of uranium mines. Roughly 750 miles south of Arlet is the capital of Niger, Niamey. It's here that the politics of what Goviex has found are playing out. This is the headquarters of Niger's Ministry of Mines. Hassan Baraz Moussa, the
the Minister of Mines, is the man responsible for the country's uranium business. Ça fait 40 ans que le Niger produit de l'uranium. C'est quand même euh, une belle expérience que nous avons dans le domaine de la, de la production de l'uranium. Alors, c'est la principale ressource pendant 40 ans euh, qui contribue aux, aux recettes budgétaires. Niger is heavily dependent on tax revenues from the uranium sector to fund the national budget and keep the country running. It's why Goviex received its mining permit, the license that allows the company to construct and operate a uranium mine at Matawela in only six months in 2016. But there's likely another, even more pressing reason the permit was fast-tracked. Everyone knows that Arriva's mines are, are, are long in the tooth. They're, they're, they're facing closure in the, in the near term. When Arriva's operations do shut down, the Nigerian government is going to be short on cash. They need Goviex to build a mine, and it's why they're so supportive of the project. But for me, there was an issue I needed to settle before I could buy into the government's enthusiasm. So one main issue for investors uh, in this country is security. What is the security situation like in the uranium producing parts of the country? C'est vrai que nous sommes euh, euh, entourés de pays euh, qui ont une sécurité, une insécurité euh, grandissante, euh, la Libye, le Mali, le Tchad, mais le Niger constitue un, un îlot, un, une île de paix dans un océan d'insécurité. Euh, le gouvernement a mis en place, a investi énormément pour assurer, la, pour assurer la sécurité des, des Nigériens d'abord et puis des investisseurs. This investment in security was clear to me from day one. Niger is serious about becoming a destination for investment capital. I think one thing that people do not appreciate is that it has one of the longest running stable governments, but more importantly, Arriva have been producing uranium since 1971 and have never missed a single shipment from that country. Now that tells you a lot about a region and the way that it operates. For a resource project to be successful in any country, it needs people, local people, to support it. The three most important regional officials I met with, the Member of Parliament from Arlet, Arlet's local governor, and Arlet's director of mines, each gave me their stamp of approval. Pour le cas de Govex, depuis que Govex a commencé les recherches dans la zone d'Arlit, vraiment nous avons constaté quand même comment on appelle ça, des effets positifs, impact sur la population. Puisque pendant les périodes un peu difficiles, quand vous prenez en 2008-2009 jusqu'à 2010, Govex a fait des gestes de dons alimentaires pour la population de la zone. Et ils ont vraiment euh, fait de forage d'eau pour la population. But efforts building wells to support the local population wasn't the most impressive thing I noticed on the ground. In 2009, we Nigerianized our company completely. We have no expatriates. With a uranium mining legacy 50 years long, Niger has the local expertise to run a mine. You know, we can employ 20,000 expats if we wanted to, but what would it be the point? We can get a Nigerian to do the job. So this is the common thought of the region. They're here to take our wealth and then to go back with it. We're not getting anything. We are sharing. We live with them together. They live on our compound. We are friends. We can sit down and take the Tuareg tea together. We, we know it's not, there's no border, no limit between them and us. What comes next for Goviex will define the success of the company. We have a, a world-class resource. We're very near-term mining. We've got all permits to allow us to build the mine. We've got a very strong shareholder base with Cameco, Denison, Ivano Industries, and Toshiba, all strategic, very powerful partners in the share registry. We've got very strong support from the Canadian government. We believe we'll be able to attract the, the equity component to build the mine. So when you add it all up, I think that we're, you know, we're easily a $1 stock you know, from 10 cents to a dollar, I, I think that we, we can get there. With Goviex's mine tentatively scheduled to be operational by 2020, Govind, Daniel, and their team still have a lot of work to do. 
but with a market cap under $50 million, the prospect of a rising uranium price, and a history of companies with similar resources being bought out for billions in previous cycles, Goviex is one of the most compelling high-risk, high-reward investment plays available today.